with us. We certainly appreciate your attendance with us. We have a special person here today for the first time. We do this a lot, don't we? Healthy children's ministry around here. Eliza Wynn is here for the first time with her parents Jacob and Stephanie. Would you guys come up here? Come on up. Is Nathan with us? No, okay. Oh yeah. Sing it out there. This is the first time that they have been here with Eliza. We want to welcome them. Would you do that now? A memento to remember the first time that you were at church, and we hope that you'll be here every Sunday as we raise this baby as family together. One of our elders, Todd White, is going to come and lead a prayer over the family. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you this morning for, uh, for your grace and your love. And Father, we thank you that you've called us into your family. And we celebrate this morning with uh, Jacob and Stephanie. And we just thank you for Eliza. Father, we thank you for the gift of life. Thank you for the joy that it brings us. And we pray that you would 
bless Eliza as she grows. I pray that you'd bless Jacob and Stephanie, Father, as they just try to be parents who lead her and guide her. We pray, Father, that she would be safe, that she'd be healthy. Most of all, though, we pray that she would come to know you as her father. And so as they grow together, Father, we just ask your blessing. We pray that you'd grant wisdom, that you'd grant perseverance and strength where it's needed, that you would grant great patience, and that, Father, you would bless us as a church family as we walk with them. It's through Jesus we pray. Amen. And as we have celebrated one birth, we will also celebrate another birth in a different way. Caleb McDonald and his dad, Kevin. All right, one of our favorite Bible verses in our family, uh, obviously, is, uh, is Numbers 14, 24. Um, in that verse, it says, My servant Caleb has a different spirit and follows me wholeheartedly. Um, so Caleb's following him wholeheartedly this morning. And I believe, I believe the different spirit that Caleb here has is um, he really loves other people. He really cares about them. He, um, he understands the, the consequences of their wrong decisions, and he, and he cares for them, and um, he loves them. I, I thank the angels are rejoicing in heaven this morning because uh, they know they've got somebody here on earth on their team to, to care for the people here. Um, so I'm going to ask you, Caleb, you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that he died on the cross for you and that he rose again and he's in heaven preparing a place for you? Yes, sir. All right, awesome. So based on that confession, I'm going to baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit uh, so that your sins will be continually washed away by his blood. Let's stand together, please. Salvation belongs to our God who sits upon the throne and unto the Lamb be praise and glory, wisdom and thanks. One spirit, one voice. 
That's a great song uh, to pause and say welcome to this particular congregation of the body of Christ. We're glad you're here. If you're a guest with us this morning, thanks for coming out to be with us today. We're honored by your being here. Um, if you have, uh, if you're looking for a new church home, we've got something in common because we're always looking for new family members. We'd love to talk with you about that. If you've got questions, uh, we've got questions too, and we'd be honored if you join us in a quest for answers if you are sometimes baffled by all this religious stuff us too and we could probably share some experiences I was uh, having a conversation with some guys during Sunday school in our class and uh, we started noticing that several of us in that class had been fired from other churches so this is the place where people who get fired from other churches come to church so you're welcome. If you've been fired, so have we. So glad you're here. Uh, this, in just a second, we're going to take up a contribution. And uh, if you want to go ahead, if you're a member, go ahead and, and note on your card that you're here today. If you're a guest, you can fill out one of those cards. You can put it in the collection plate when it passes in just a minute. Um, and then uh, if you want to make a prayer request on that card, you can do so. You can indicate whether you want everybody in the whole church to pray about it. Or if it's more private matter, you can ask just the shepherds and the staff to pray over it. Either way, you can put, fill that out, put those uh, cards in the collection plate when they pass in just a second. Um, speaking of contributions, a lot of times people give at the church and they don't really know what it's for. It's just, you know, we just put money in the plate and it goes by. I thought it'd be a good idea if we talked about a little bit just for a second one of the things that our giving goes to, there's a program that many of us in, are, involved, are involved with here at Twickenham called Jobs for Life. Uh, it's a program that works with adults. And we've got a lot of different programs that work with, with people in tough situations, but this particular ministry works with, with adults. And it, it helps people who are often trapped in generational poverty, just their grandparents were in poverty and their parents were in poverty and they're in poverty and their kids are in poverty we, we try to take those adults and give them some skills teach them some skills in a in a context of christian love and support uh, and focus on spiritual values that enables them to develop the skills they need to become productive to break that cycle of poverty and to provide for their children let me just tell you about one person that some of you may have heard about before, but others perhaps not. Her name is Harmony, and Harmony was in a, a pretty tough spot before she started coming here and attending Jobs for Life classes. 
Uh, she was working at a minimum wage job. It was not enough to provide for her and her three children. She was a recovering drug addict and convicted felon. She had never even applied for a job. Didn't know how, had never done it because she was confident nobody would hire a convicted felon with her kind of record anyway. Let, let me read just a part of what she says. I prayed for a window and I got a door called Jobs for Life. I needed a chance and Jobs for Life got me that chance. It taught me that I was valuable and gave me the confidence I needed to overcome obstacles that seemed like mountains to me. My JFL, my Jobs for Life team may not know this, but they changed everything about me. They taught me not only how to deal with the past, but how to speak properly, how to eat in public, how to walk with integrity and moral character, and how to give generously, and most of all, how to love like Jesus. The Bible says, and this is Harmony, I'm, this is her quote, the Bible says, the Lord will give you exceedingly abundantly more than you can ask or even imagine. I am proof of that. He gave me beauty for ashes. He took me from the pit to the palace, just like Joseph. Jobs for Life perfected that purpose for me. There are so many people out there just like me who need just a chance. I think Jobs for Life is the most valuable program out there. It is the work of God himself. When you give on Sunday, a part of the money you give goes to a ministry like that. There are a lot of other ministries going on here like that, but a part of what you give goes to Jobs for Life. Now, it's not just money, but you may also have interest in investing some of your time and your talents in a ministry like that. On September 1st, Tuesday, here in our fellowship hall, we are hosting the Global Breakfast of Champions. It's a telecast of communities worldwide that are affiliated with Jobs for Life and leaders from all over the world will be involved in that hour and a half long breakfast. Uh, and we'll be, we'll be, it'll be streamed live here at our building and we'll be, uh, be a part of that to hear what's going on and, and, to, and to gather ideas for how we can be effective in helping feed people in our community to become productive citizens who are not only able to take care of themselves and their children, but others as well. That's a part of what happens when you give on Sundays. Let's pray over our giving, and then we'll continue with our worship. Father, we're thankful for the opportunity that is afforded us every Sunday when these plates pass. Help us to realize that this is more than just paying the bills, that we are actually funding ministries that change lives. Help us, Father, to be generous, so much so that even if they took away the tax-exempt uh, status of our contributions, we would still give because we care about what happens in the lives of people. Make us generous and bless us to be more generous than we are even right now. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Precious cornerstone, sure foundation, you are faithful to the end. We are church let the righteousness of god be a holy flame that burns let the saving love of christ be the measure of our lives we believe you're all to us only son of god sent from heaven hope and mercy church let the righteousness of god be a holy flame that burns let the saving love of christ be the
the measure of our lives. We believe you're all to us. You're all to us. You're all to us. You're all to us. You are witness past. As we commune together the words from Paul in Ephesians 3. I became a servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace given me through the working of his power. Although I am less than the least of all the Lord's people, this grace was given to me to preach to the Gentiles the boundless riches of Christ and to make plain to everyone the administration of this mystery, which for ages past was kept hidden in God, who created all things. His intent was that now, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms, according to his eternal purpose that he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. In him, and through faith in him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. God, we are thankful that we can approach you in freedom and in conf confidence through the sacrifice of the body of your son. We offer our thanks for this bread and we ask your blessings as we take it together, we, the church. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. is to see the nations worship our cry our prayer is to sing your praise to the ends of the earth that with one mighty voice every tribe 
tongue rejoices our heart our desire is to see the nations worship you our heart our desire is to see the nations worship our cry our prayer is to sing your praise to the ends of the earth that with one mighty voice every tribe and tongue rejoices our heart our desire is to see the nations worship you. Paul continues, For this reason I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. God, how, to, how do we possibly grasp how wide and how long and how deep is your love. And how do we experience your fullness in this small sip of the fruit of the vine? We pause to wonder and to think for a moment in awe what a great sacrifice it was that you would give your blood. And we thank you for this cup, and we ask your blessings on it as we share it together, the church. In Jesus' name, amen. He is able, more than able, to accomplish what concerns me today. He is able, more than able, to handle anything that comes 
comes my way. He is able, more than able, to do much more than I could ever dream. what concerns me today. You are able, more than able, to handle anything that comes my way. Paul concludes, now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. And the whole church said, amen. amen. Let's stand together. Come set your rule and reign in our hearts again. Increase in us, we pray. Unveil why we're made. Come set our hearts ablaze with hope, like wildfire in our very souls. Holy Spirit, come invade us now. We are your church. We need your power in us we seek your kingdom first we hunger and we thirst refuse to waste our lives for your our joy and prize to see the captives hearts release the hurt the sick the poor at peace we lay down our lives for heaven's cause we are your church. We pray revive this earth. Build your kingdom here. Let the darkness fear. Show your mighty hand. Heal our streets and land. Set your church on fire. Win this nation back. Change the Reaching the near and far, no force of hell can stop. Your beauty changing hearts, you made us for much more than this. Awake the kingdom seed in us, fill us with the strength and love of Christ. We are your church, we are the hope on earth. Your kingdom here, let the darkness fear. Show your mighty hand, heal our streets and land. Set your church on fire, win this nation back. Change the atmosphere, build your kingdom here, build your kingdom. Let the darkness fear, show your mighty hand, heal our streets and land, set your church on fire, win this nation back, change the atmosphere, build your kingdom here, we pray. Amen. Be seated, be seated please.
If you want to turn in your Bibles uh, in just a second, we're going to be in Jeremiah chapter 7. Jeremiah chapter 7. It's in the Old Testament, and there's too many books from Genesis to Jeremiah for me to rattle them off. So start in Psalms and go that way. Um, I just noticed a line in that song that I'd never noticed before. It's an audacious claim. We are the hope of earth. The church is the hope of earth. Really? We're going to kind of talk about that today. Because if, that, uh, if you think about that a little bit, that's, man, that's bold and brash. And I think some of us wonder if it's even right. We're in a series uh, called Just Like Jesus. And for the last several weeks, we've been trying to figure out how can we be more like he was. Uh, and, and we looked at some specific things. Uh, we, we talked about uh, power. How can we be just like Jesus in terms of power, which is a kind of a big deal right now and will be for the next 15 months because there are what, 72 Republicans who want to be president? Is that, is that what we have, right? And there, of course, the, the Democrats wish they had about 72 other people, I think, that could be running for the office. So power is kind of a big issue right now. Everybody's talking about power. So a couple of weeks ago, we talked about how would Jesus handle power. And if we're going to live like he lived, how, how do we handle it? And then last week we talked about wealth, and that's obviously something that people are always worried about, money. And we, so we talked about that, and how Jesus would handle that. And this week we're going to hit on another sort of touchy subject. Um, we're going to talk about how Jesus would relate to religion, which is a thing that I, I think a lot of people really don't like religion in fact let me let's start with a quote here i'm going to share a quote with you and what i want you to do is listen carefully because we're going to do a multiple choice test okay so here we go oh good it's up here here we go hostile to church friendly to jesus i'm going to ask you to figure out who said this hostile to church friendly to jesus these words describe large numbers of people especially young people today they are opposed to anything that savors of institutionalism they detest the establishment and its entrenched privileges, and they reject the church, not without some justification, because they regard it as impossibly corrupt. Okay, multiple choice. Were these words spoken by A, Bono, lead singer for U2 at a recent conference on world hunger? And some, of, some people are going, oh, no way. You should listen to some of U2's lyrics, okay? There, there's a ton of Christian stuff in U2's lyrics, and I don't know what brand of Christian Bono is, but he's some brand. So you just go home and look, look that up. Okay, was it, did he say that, or was it Pope Francis in a recent encyclical? He said a lot of stuff about this kind of thing. Or was it Andy Stanley? And I know some of you are going, well, uh, we, don't, we don't listen to Andy Stanley. Yes, you do. You people listen to him every week online i know you do because you come up and say boy you should have heard what andy stanley said and then the last one is john stott christian cleric and author in a book he wrote called basic christianity okay so now if you if you said it was a bono you still haven't found what you're looking for because that's not the right answer yeah, that was pretty good that was good thank you <laughs> if you guessed b pope francis Say five Hail Marys and call me tomorrow because that's not right either. <laughs> Andy Stanley, you no longer get to sit at the cool kids table because he didn't say it either. And D, John Stott is the correct answer. John Stott said that in his book, Basic Christianity, in 1958. Okay, so it was a trick question. The issue is not so much when it was said, or who said it, but when it was said. That quote is older than I am. Okay, 60, over 60 years ago, almost 60 years ago, people were drawn to Jesus, but put off by the church, which is where I think a lot of people are today. I guess what goes around goes around again. Jesus is and was, and, and I think probably always will be a very compelling figure, but the church in many cases is a pariah. Stott said in 1958, and if you can get your hands on anything John Stott wrote, it'll be worth the read. 
said in 1958 that one of the reasons people were, were open to Jesus but against the church was the issue of institutionalism. So we should talk about what that means, not because I think you don't know, but people use words differently, okay? Like when I was a kid, my mother would sometimes grab her hair with both hands and she would say to my brother and me, if you two don't stop, they're going to put me in Milledgeville. Milledgeville was the state institution in Georgia, okay? Now, in West Tennessee, it's Bolivar. I don't know what it is now. What's the state institution in Alabama? Where is it? Where? Bryce. Tuscaloosa. I guess I walked into that one, didn't I? You know what? That's because they couldn't find enough sane people in Auburn to build one there. So I you know. I know football season's about to get started, and so we're going to declare a moratorium on all of that, okay? So, uh, I've got a, I got a bulldog, if you guys would like to uh, pet a bulldog, so, okay. So, that's not what we mean by institutionalism. I, I, I think what he meant is kind of an abstract concept, so I want to come at it from a couple of different angles, this idea of institutionalism and how it relates to religion and why it turns people off of church. Uh, so what, what I want to do is kind of give you a, 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 a dictionary definition of institutionalism. And then I'm going to tell you a story, and then I'll give you a couple of images. Okay, definition from the dictionary, story, metaphors, images. All right. Here's the technical definition: institutionalism occurs when the ways in which an organization fulfills its mission become so embedded within the, organiz within the group's identity that it can no longer tell the difference between the mission and the means by which the mission is fulfilled. When, when you've been, as an organization, when you've been around so long and you've done things the same way for so long, you get to a point where you can't tell a difference between what you're supposed to be doing and how you're supposed to do it. Um, groups can become prisoners of the way they, they, they do things. And you can tell an organization has fallen into institutionalism when it becomes less concerned about the mission and more focused on protecting itself and its systems. Yeah, that's kind of a, a dictionary definition. Now I'm gonna tell you a story and uh, this story is even older than that John Stott quote that we started with. In fact, I, I tried to find the original place where I heard this. Uh, I heard the story when I was a kid. That's how old it is. And it goes back to 1953, is as far back as I can find it. Uh, originally told by a guy uh, named Thomas Waddell. And I, I don't even know if he's the original teller, but that's as, as early as I could find it. Some of you have heard this story in one version or another, and then others of us, it's going to be so old that it's brand new again, but it really gets to the point of, I think, what we're talking about when we talk about institutionalism. So the story goes like this. On a dangerous coast where shipwrecks often occurred, there was once a little life-saving station. The building was primitive, and there was just one boat, but the members were extremely committed, and they kept a constant watch over the sea. And their success at saving lives brought them such considerable fame that a lot of people wanted to be a part of the life-saving station. And so they joined, they gave their money to support the work. They wound up, wound up buying new boats, new crews were recruited. They started offering formal training sessions for life-saving. And as the membership grew though, some of the folks became unhappy because the building was so primitive. It was basically a lean-to on the beach, and they wanted something nicer, so they built a new one. And they threw out the old cots, and they put in nice four-poster beds, and they decorated the whole place to feel like home. And it became such a, a nice place that they just started kind of hanging out there. It was just a good place to go hang out. And they would eat together, and they would greet each other with hugs, and they'd share what was going on in their lives. And at that point, fewer members were interested in actually watching the coast. 
and rescuing the shipwreck, so they hired some professional crews to do that for them. About that time, a large ship ran aground and broke up, and the hired crews went out and brought in all the victims, but the victims were wet and dirty, and some of them were sick. And in the chaos of the rescue, some of the walls and furnishings in the uh, clubhouse were damaged. The floors were fouled. The carpets were soaked. The next morning, the, the property committee had a meeting, and they decided they would build a shower outside the clubhouse so that when people were rescued, they could be cleaned up before they were actually brought in. And a lot of the folks started suggesting that maybe we just not do life-saving at all because it's interfering with all our social activities. But there were other folks who said, that's not why we're here. Our mission is to, is to save people who, who, who are lost at sea. And they were told, well, if that's what you want to do, then you just go on down the beach and start another life-saving station, which they did. And so in time, they became famous because they were quite effective. And a lot of people joined them, and they built a new life-saving station to replace the primitive one that they'd started with, and it's a very nice station. They meet there all the time. They eat together, and they share hugs and tell each other what's going on in their lives, and they're thinking about building a shower outside just in case they need it. And that was the definition. There's the story. Are you uncomfortable yet? Here's the images. A couple of images. I want you to think about a club, not the kind you beat people over the head with or hit a golf ball with. I want you to think about a club, the kind of club that you would join. Okay? Maybe it is a golf club or a bridge club or a dinner club or a book club. All clubs, every one of them, exists for the sake of its members. And that's okay. That's what clubs do. That's what clubs are for. You can, you can join the club There'll be some hoops to jump through, and there'll be some dues to pay, and some rules to obey, and some traditions will develop, but, but the club exists for its members. You'll have to assume some responsibilities, but really all of the dues that you pay and the rules that you obey and the responsibilities you, you assume, all of that is just to enhance the club experience for all its members, because clubs exist for the members, and, that, and that's okay, that's what clubs do. Now the other image I want to give you is the image of a cause. Okay, you got the club, think of a cause now. Maybe you've been caught up in a cause. Maybe you signed on for a cause before, a political cause, a social cause. Causes don't exist for the sake of the members. In fact, it's just the opposite. Members of a cause exists for the cause. Huge differences between a club and a cause. A club wants to keep its members comfortable. A cause wants to keep its members committed. A club tries to be selective about who gets in. A cause will welcome anybody who can fog a mirror if they are committed to the cause. A club wants to protect its traditions a cause wants to change its community. So I'm hoping that the, the definition that we started with and the story that I told you and those two images will help us think about what institutionalism is and, and, and why it, it wasn't just a problem in 1958 when John Stott talked about it, but it's also a problem in 2015. The, the truth is, though, you can find the problem of institutionalism a lot further back than 1958 or 1953, you can find it in the 6th or 7th century B.C. That's why I wanted you to look in Jeremiah. Because on one occasion, God told the prophet to stand outside the Jewish temple in Jerusalem and rail against its club-like mentality that, that, had, that had taken up there. Listen, listen to Jeremiah chapter 7. I'm going to read uh, beginning in verse 1. We'll read down. I think I told you guys on the slides that I was just going to go to verse 4. I'm going to read all the way down through verse 11. So you won't see it on the screen, but that's my bad. This is the word of the Lord, or this is the word that, that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Stand at the gate of the Lord's house and there proclaim this message. 
Hear the word of the Lord, all you people of Judah who come through these gates to worship the Lord. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says. Reform your ways and your actions, and I will let you live in this place. Do not trust in deceptive words. Look at verse 4. This is really important. Do not trust in deceptive words and say, this is the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. If you really change your ways and your actions and deal with each other justly, if you do not oppress the foreigner, the fatherless, or the widow, and do not shed innocent blood in this place, and if you do not follow other gods to your own harm, then I will let you live in this place, in the land I give your ancestors forever and ever. But look, you are trusting in deceptive words that are worthless. Will you steal and murder commit adultery and perjury, burn incense to Baal, a foreign god, and follow other gods you have not known, and then, come to, and, and then come and stand before me in this house, which bears my name, and say, we are safe, safe to do all these detestable things. And in verse 11, has this house, which bears my name, become a den of robbers to you? But I have been watching, declares the Lord. Now that last part may sound familiar he comes up again seven centuries later in exactly the same location the temple except this time the one speaking is a prophet named not jeremiah but jesus and here's how matthew chapter 21 21 verses 12 and 13 tell that story jesus entered the temple courts and drove out all who were buying and selling there he overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves, it is written, he said to them, my house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it, and here's that Jeremiah quote, a den of robbers. Jesus and people who are turned off by institutionalism have something in common. He didn't like it either. In fact, he was hostile toward institutionalism. Now, I really want to emphasize here. I want you to hear me. Jesus was not hostile toward the temple. He called it a house of prayer. He called the temple his father's house. So if you're thinking that being down on religious institutions in general or being down on the church in particular puts you in in good company with Jesus, you're wrong. He himself said, I will build my church. It was his idea. Paul even takes it a step further than that. Paul calls the church in Ephesians 5, the bride of Christ. It's kind of hard to say you love Jesus and hate on his bride. But the most visceral metaphor the Bible uses to talk about the relationship between Jesus and the church is the body. Paul says that the church is not just something he built, it's not just his bride, it's the very body of Christ. That's why we spent so much time at the beginning, over half the sermon, defining institutionalism. That's the thing that Jesus was opposed to and I think still is. He he drove out of the temple the people who had turned it into something it was never intended to be. He tried to restore it to its original mission, to be a place where people could come into contact with the mercy and power of God. That's what he wants the church to be. But he did not hate the idea of religion, and he didn't hate the idea of organized religion. He opposed what religion can become. Now, here's the danger for us, and and it's... It's not just us, okay, in, it, at Twickenham. And it's not just us in the churches of Christ. If I were a Baptist pastor, I'd, I'd be saying the same thing. If I were a Catholic priest, I, think I'd, I hope I'd be saying the same thing. But I'm, I'm one of us, so here's what I'm saying to us. That the danger that, that we have is that we don't think that the, the thing that Jesus despised about religion could ever happen to us. We think that it'll happen to other religious bodies, but not to us, because we're, we're us, and we're the Church of Christ, and we're not going to let that happen. 
Richard Halverson was chaplain of the U.S. Senate for many years. In, in 1984, he addressed the uh, General Assembly of the Presbyterian Church. I think Halverson was himself a Presbyterian. I want to read you something he said in that speech. In the beginning, the church was a fellowship of men and women who centered their lives on the living Christ. They had a personal and vital relationship with the Lord. It transformed them and the world around them. Then the church moved to Greece and it became a philosophy. Later it moved to Rome and it became an institution. Next it moved to Europe and became a culture. And then finally it came to America and became an enterprise. Some versions of that quote say it became a business. A decent church historian can poke all kind of holes in Halverson's reductionistic summary, but there's truth in what he says. There's truth there. And, and we know that. So I want to I want to give you a warning. I want to give you an affirmation and I want to give you a challenge. Here's the warning. And I, and I want you and me to take this personally, okay? Jeremiah warned the people coming into the temple not to trust deceptive words by saying, this is the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. They assumed that however unrighteously they were living, however unjustly they were treating other people, all would be offset because they were connected to the one true God and the one true temple. There have been times in my life when no matter how unrighteously I lived or how unjustly I treated others, I thought I was okay because I was a member of the Church of Christ, the Church of Christ, the Church of Christ. The, the warning is that what happened to so many religious bodies down through the centuries can happen to me and to you and to us. We, we can never assume that our religious affiliation takes the place of righteous authenticity. Okay, that's the warning. Second thing I want to do is give you an affirmation. I want to affirm the value of the church. Remember, we sang that song a minute ago where we were talking about we are the hope, and we, we talk a lot about how important the church is. I want to affirm that. I want to affirm the biblical value of the church because so many voices these days are, are crying out are arousing yes to Jesus and a resounding no to the church and, and it, a lot of people think that's that's kind of a, a new and cool way to be it's just awesome that we've got this new place where we're all yes to Jesus and and no to the church that's not new at all that's been around for a very very long time people have always said that or something like it. I always just, I, I, sometimes, some days I get a kick out of it, and some days it just burns my toes when I'll read something that our critics say. And they'll tweet it, or pen it, or Instagram it, or Snapchat it, or whatever. They'll, they'll do that famous Gandhi quote, uh, I love your Jesus, I don't like your Christians. There's never, there's no evidence Gandhi ever said anything like that anyway. Um, and, and, and they say it like it's something new and cool. It's old and worn out. But the Bible's position on the institution of the church is unequivocal. Jesus' position on the value of the church is unequivocal. In Ephesians 5, Paul says the church is, is, is the bride and that Jesus loves her. And what God has joined together, we can't separate. You can't love Jesus and reject the bride. In 1 Corinthians 12, Paul said that Jesus is the head of the church. As much as you want to decapitate the head from the body, you can't. The church and the head are inseparable. When Jesus confronted Saul on the road to Damascus, Saul, who we, a couple of weeks ago we were looking at this, Saul was persecuting the church, trying to kill off Christians. What did Jesus say? Jesus did, did not say, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting the church? He said, why are you persecuting me? Jesus and the church are inextricably connected. The church is not now, nor has it ever been perfect. There's an author named Dorothy Solly, I believe it was Dorothy Solly, who said there have been three great humiliations in, in, for God in history. The incarnation, when God became a human being, 
That was a deep humiliation. The crucifixion was a humiliation. And the third great humiliation for God is the church, the body. We are not perfect. We know we are not perfect. But we will be one day. Not here. Not until Jesus comes back. But when he comes back, then he will present us to himself as a bride without blemish. Until then, the church lives under the redemptive grace of Jesus Christ, receiving daily, hourly, minute-by-minute forgiveness as we confess our sins. We can be mad at the church, and I have been. We can be put out with the church. We can be disappointed in the church. But eventually, we have to come to peace with the church because it is inseparable from Jesus Christ. If the question is, how does Jesus relate to the church? The answer is, he loves us despite our failures. He forgives us. That's the affirmation. Here's the challenge. Lisa and I have been here long enough to know now a little bit of the heart of this church. And what we have seen is that there is deep concern here for children who are trapped in poverty. That's why so many of you are involved with Huntsville Inner City Learning Center. You, you are deeply concerned. You give your time, you give your energy, you give your experience, your expertise. You're deeply concerned about those children. There is a passion, too, to help men and women to develop life skills they need to lead their families out of generational poverty. That's why many of you are invested in jobs for life. And, and it matters little if the people in need live down the street or in a distant country because a lot of you travel on a regular basis to Ecuador to care for children who've been neglected or abused there. Some of you will be going this week. There are so many good things going on here. So here's the challenge. We're not there now so let's make sure that Twickenham never becomes a club. Not even Club Jesus. Let's make sure that we stay committed to a cause, not a club. We're going to close with a prayer, um, and then we'll essentially be done. I think we've got an announcement or two. If you need prayer this morning. If you need to talk to somebody about a struggle that you're having, if you're burdened with something, uh, you can exit to my right. The first door on the right is called our Twickenham room. Some of our shepherds are going to be over there. They'll be happy to speak with you and pray with you for whatever you need. But right now, I'd like for us to close with a prayer. So let's, let's bow together as, as we pray. Almighty and ever-living God, ruler of all things in heaven and earth, Hear our prayers for your church. Strengthen the faithful, arouse the careless, restore the penitent. Grant us all things necessary for our common life and bring us all to be of one heart and one mind. How great is your love, Lord God. How wide is your mercy. Never let us board up the narrow gate that leads to life with rules or doctrines that you dismiss, but give us a spirit to welcome all people so that your church may never exclude those who are included in the love of Jesus Christ who came to save us all. In his name we pray. Amen. Good morning, amen. We got babies and baptisms and communion and preaching. Preach it. Good stuff. And we have these things as we conclude. Uh, there's a baby shower for Jay and Hildy Dryden on Sunday, August the 30th from 1.30 to 3 in the Mercy Building. They're registered at Target and Babies R Us, and Jay and Hildy are expecting a boy. Parents of first through fifth graders, put your antennas up, please. Promotion Sunday with our summer TCM program ending Current first through fifth graders will only have class next Sunday. So you will need to pick your kids up after class time for church. 
Men's fishing trip, the sixth annual men's trout fishing trip to Heber Springs, Arkansas, is scheduled for September the 24th through the 27th. No trout fishing experience is necessary. For more information or to sign up, contact Robin Bridges, who is this lovely gentleman sitting here on the third. There he is right there. Robin, see Robin after services today. Jobs for Life, as Jody mentioned, Global Breakfast of Champions on September the 1st. We are hosting a site for the JFL Global Breakfast of Champions, live streaming video. If you're involved in JFL or interested in learning more, contact Ken Smith. Fall small groups. In just a few weeks, we will begin sign-ups for our 2015 fall session of small groups. If you're interested in hosting or leading a small group September through December or would like more information about leading a small group, contact Steve Krigger. And lastly, Jody and Lisa have been living in a one-bedroom apartment for... Four months. Is it only four months? Four weeks. It seems like a lot longer, doesn't it? <laughs> With two dogs, and they moved into a home yesterday... And I think that's important because I think it means they're staying, which is a good thing, amen? Because we are glad to have them. And as always, we're glad that you're here. We hope you have a great day today and a great week. Let's stand together, sing one more chorus, and we'll close in prayer. Build your kingdom here, let the darkness fear. Show your mighty hand, heal our streets and land. Set your church on fire, win this nation back. Change the atmosphere, build your kingdom here. Build your kingdom here. Let the darkness fear, show your mighty hand, heal our streets and land, set your church on fire, win this nation back, change the atmosphere, build your kingdom here, we pray. Jody, thank you. That was an awesome, awesome sermon. Uh, hold it dear. That's, that's powerful stuff. Um, bow with me. Father, thank you for today. Uh, Father, we love you. Uh, we praise you. Um, we're so thankful that uh, you open us all without exclusion, but total inclusion to be close and drawn to you. Father, let us not be anxious for today or tomorrow. Give us the strength to work through our struggles, our, our pains, our trials. Give us the strength for each day. Keep us sh focused on the short run, but always knowing that the long run is to you. Father, thank you for all you do and all that you provide us with. It's in your holy name we pray. Amen.